Good day, John. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Ah, it's a pleasure. Yeah, good to see you again. Yes. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and, and also tell us a little bit about where you grew up and where you went to college and what you studied? Right, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm now living in Sheffield in the UK, which is in Yorkshire, um, in, a, in an old... Uh, 104 year old house made of Yorkshire grit stone. Uh, everyone knows Yorkshire because uh, they made a film about naked men dancing around in Yorkshire called The Full Monty. Yes. And it was made in Sheffield. I, uh, uh, I'm very glad that it, made, it was a success, but it wasn't what I consider to be Yorkshire taste, to be quite honest. But anyway, um, they're great people. They really are. Uh, and they are very cultural. We have, in my little city, we have 38 choirs. Uh, and we have, uh, f at Christmas time, we have choral singing for the choirs in the pubs. And people come from London and the Southwest, traveling 200 miles to join the Sheffield choirs. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that takes me back to where I came from, because I was born and brought up in Africa. In a, in a country which is called Northern Rhodesia. And of course, the Africans have a great choral tradition themselves. Uh, and um, they, it was always, you could always hear every night. I, I worked on the mines, my father was a miner. Uh, and every night you'd hear the drums and the singing uh, from, the, from what they call the black compound, where the black workers stayed. Um, and the newcomers to the mines really got very nervous when they heard that. I suppose it was a bit like the old West, the Wild West when you heard the drums and saw the smoke signals. Um, and they thought they were going to sort of be murdered in their beds. Hmm. Uh, that was the picture of Africa. But uh, it was a very, very safe, good society. And the mine itself... Uh, the mining mentality is something which I really enjoy. You know, these are people who work hard uh, and who play hard, but who also form great friendships uh, and look after each other. Um, and in fact, uh, everyone, every miner uh, that when they got to sort of supervisor level had to pass first aid examinations. So if you, the safest place to have a car accident was in my hometown. Uh, there'd always be someone who knew how to use first aid. And then um, the mine itself was very efficient because it was low-grade copper ore and, and cobalt. So we were very careful about conserving every bit of value in the mine. And so we had um, planned maintenance and we had uh, no mess anywhere. People drove carefully. Uh, things were timed well. Uh, but it was a, you know, it was a very vibrant society because you could come uh, from my house, drive nine miles, and you could shoot an antelope, and people would be seen coming back with a kudu or a rowan antelope in the back of their, what you would call uh, wagons, station yes. wagons or something. Yeah. Um, and uh, and the and the it, it was always there. There was always snakes around, and there were beautifully coloured birds. So it was a uh, full of energy. That's what I loved about Africa. Full of energy. Um, I was sent uh, to boarding school in South Africa, uh, uh, to a Catholic boarding school, uh, and uh, that was my first, um, my first introduction to violence and bullying uh, at the school. And, and I understand now it's quite common among Catholic schools. There's a history of it, um, which I didn't understand. It was also my first introduction to apartheid, to blacks being put down, which I found very shocking. Um, but anyway, I left the school quite early, uh, as soon as I could, in fact, um, and uh, finished my education back in northern Rhodesia, uh, and then went back to South Africa for my university education in a university called Rhodes University. Uh, and again, again, the, 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 the apartheid, the racial discrimination, I found so shocking. Uh, it was, I, again, I couldn't wait to get back or get out of there uh, for a, 
So I went to England for a year when I graduated. And of course, you know, England was the world's greatest democracy. I've never experienced such freedom uh, and such openness. And it was fantastic. I loved it. Uh, and uh, after uh, 18 months, they discovered that my passport had expired. And so they, I became a, a displaced person in a way mm. and had to make my way back to South Africa. I had a good job in England. I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the English people very much. Uh, and I was very fortunate because I ended up back on the mines on a, on a major project, which was to what they called Zambianization, which is to find black Zambians who could take the place of the lower level supervisors and then start uh, a promotion program of accelerated promotion. Um, and that meant that I, um, I was part of a, a psychological team which put together all the all the norms, African norms, for detecting where the potential was. Um, and we, we roamed the country uh, because we wanted to collect from the villages as well as from the towns. So that meant that um, twice, on three on two occasions, I was in a DC-3 uh, and we landed in dry river beds. And then um, when, you, when you took off again, you had to get a bunch of guys holding the back, the back of the plane back, while it revved up. And if you remember, the DC three was a was a tail had a, 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 a wheel of the tail, not a nose wheel, but a tail wheel. So they waited, and the engines revved and revved and revved and revved, and then gradually the tail lifted with these guys clinging to it. And then pilot stuck his hand up, and they let go. <laughs> we took off. <laughs> it was very exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, as a result of that, um, I, I learned a lot about um, very, very, very simple things. Uh, for example, that uh, intelligence and education are important, but actually the most important thing for most black Africans was nutrition. Yes. The malnutrition was what held them back because it diminished the edu it diminished the education ability, it diminished the IQ, because your, your malnutrition really damages your IQ. And so we, 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 you know, we came to the point where we said, okay, we need to feed people better, we need to give them good diets as well as educate them. And um, we, had a, we had a great, we had a, I think we had a great success because um, some, of the, some of the guys that within two years were already uh, even with very basic education, were capable of becoming shift bosses underground. Uh, and, or just like the white counterparts, because the white guys weren't very well educated anyway. Mm -hmm. they, they were just having to be white, and they got promoted. Uh, but um, the big thing that I discovered there was that they were also disadvantaged, the blacks were, because they were, in a sense, almost made to fail by the white social system, so at meetings they wouldn't seem they wouldn't seem to be uh, being sufficiently assertive, uh, and they could and they in the black culture you don't disagree straight away you you think about it first mm -hmm. yeah and of course in the English culture that's the first thing you do almost when someone makes a proposal yeah and so they were seen as as not very assertive. And they, and, but they, when I spoke to them about it afterwards, they saw the English as very rude because, A, they didn't let people have space to talk and, B, they didn't listen to you. <laughs> so, so it was a real puzzle because I knew then it's all very well to pick bright guys and people who really want to succeed, but you can put them into systems that will ensure they won't succeed. So you had to... I, I was looking for a system that would help these black guys understand what is going on and manage it. And of course, when I went back to England, because uh, I emigrated back to England, I met Neil Rackham. Yes. And Neil had the answer, and that was behavior analysis, analyzing behaviors. Uh, and uh, I was the first, I think I was the first person to adopt the behavior analysis approach in real life work as opposed to in research. Mm -hmm applying it as a training device. Um, 
And then I took it back to uh, Malawi, where I was the head of um, uh, the HR there, to, to, to help Malawians who had the same problem. Uh, and I was very confident in the, in, I think this is important, very important point for anyone listening is, as Dr. Deming says, you know, what's your method? By what method? And I think methodology is so important. And I had complete faith in the methodology and also in its ability to give feedback, clear, accurate feedback. So when I finished in, in, uh, in Malawi and I went back to England, I got a job with Neil and he and I and two others had this company and Neil focused on, uh, you know, he, was, he was a great researcher and he focused on the sales side because Xerox were, were, were um, funding a, a big sales uh, project. But he'd also done a lot of work on general meeting behavior and on negotiation. And I was fascinated by the negotiation because I saw that that's what the, that's what the whites had to learn to do to cope with a new black government and new black normative structure which was imposing itself on their lives. They could no longer boss you around anymore. If you, yeah, you had to actually negotiate and listen and give way, make concessions. Uh, and so I'd experienced that myself. Uh, and so that made a lot of sense to me. And when I looked at the data, uh, I thought, right, there's enough here to run, to start a training course. Uh, and I trained and I trained with Xerox. I, I, I uh, ran tra training programs for the purchasing people. So, you know, my career has been where my interest was. I mean, and, and, and I realized that's really fortunate, mm -hmm. following your interest and getting paid uh, for doing it. Uh, and in Xerox, I, I fell into the purchasing department because that's where most of the negotiation happens um, and trained ooh, a lot of their guys in the UK. And they pulled me over to uh, train in Leesburg in their big center in America, in the USA. And I did a a lot of training programs there for them there uh, and I discovered that the the Americans the, the great thing about them is that when when you say to them okay now I'm training we're in a training situation they behave like trainees they go oh, okay so I'm here to learn and they disciplined and they learn and they and the Brits just don't do that they kind of you have this you have this attitude, which is, well, who are you to train me? <laughs> so, um, and, and, and as I did this work and as the model itself kept proving that it was very effective, uh, the more people, more companies asked me to run programs, including eventually Motorola. Yes, that's where you and I met. Uh because I was sent to England for a few days and spent some time observing you doing this training delivery of your negotiation, your win-win negotiations program. That's fine. And then yep. we arranged a pilot session back in the U.S. in Phoenix um, for um, purchasing, for salespeople, and for what they were calling uh, government uh, contract negotiators that were selling the big black box uh, millions of dollars each. All secretive yeah, stuff yeah. and uh, to NASA, the NASA were there, weren't yes, they? Yes, and and um, but that but that was back in uh, 1981 or 82, I, and uh, that's right. yeah, yeah. so that's where we yeah. met. But so that's interesting. Your your observations about the differences between uh, trainees in America and England. But let's go back to you. You seem to feel that management. Uh, per Deming is, you know, can be a major obstacle to successful organizations. Can you tell us a little mm, bit mm. more about uh, uh, your, your perceptions and your insights on that? Uh, yeah, well, I, I mentioned this, this thing about the, the, when you, when the English are in, in a training situation, they kind of tend to uh, say, who are you to, to train me kind of thing. And that's the uh, symptom of a class system at work. Mm -hmm. uh, and had I been speaking with a, a Etonian accent, uh, and had I been to Oxford, then they would pay very serious attention. 
uh, the fact that I'd been out in the field and got all this data and, 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 you know, and run a proper methodological inquiry coming up with what I did. No, no, it was, it was, they used to spend the first half hour of, of my first day trying to analyze where I came from uh, and didn't pay attention to anything I was saying until I, I always opened my programs by saying, well, I'm from Africa and this, this, this is what you're listening to. The accent is African from Zambia, not Australia, not New Zealand, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, but that also meant that if you looked at that, that, that mentality, they looked down upon people who were blue collar workers. They looked down upon people who, um, who did the, the hard grind in the factory. Uh, even though a lot of these people had degrees, they were very well educated. But because they were doing manual or perceived to be doing manual work, um, they looked down upon them, and therefore they didn't think they had anything worth saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, the same thing, the same class system mentality applied when it were their suppliers, because their suppliers were selling to them. They therefore were seen as inferior, and not treated as equals or or as having real value to offer the uh, the client. So that was that was the one side of it. Um, and I, I, I looked at what they were doing, and I thought, well, this has got to be costing them money. Uh, and um, I did I did further research because I now had access because of the work I've been doing. People were interested, in it and they gave me access to uh, stuff, and they sent me stuff. And I found that, for example, in Xerox, uh, Fuji Xerox in Japan made two and a half times the profit on their sales that Xerox in the States made. And when you when you investigated that, you found it was their supply chain, their collaborative relationship to the supply chain, which in 1984, the Japanese uh, Department of Trade and Industry actually wrote and said, the secret to our success in the, in the West is our constructive relationship with our supply chain. And it's so funny because they said that loud and clear, what what the people in Britain were obsessed with, what they saw the Japanese secret weapon was quality circles. See, <laughs> and they used to have these pointless discussions on quality, um, and go on behaving in that win lose man- mentality behavior. Mm-hmm. So um, that was a, uh, and that's why they needed the, the, the negotiation training, because you could. With the one exercise we did, which you know well, red blue, they learned very quickly that in a in a when you provide win lose uh, conditions, they end up lose lose. And the classic example of that was British Leyland uh, at that time, because by nineteen by oh, about nineteen eighty, they were. They were no longer a private company. They were had to be rescued by the government. And their relationship with their suppliers was so dismal, um, as were as were many, many, many British companies, um, particularly the FMCGs. And to this day, I'm afraid the FMCGs are still bad. They are you know, they're always screwing and screwing and screwing and not paying on time. Uh, and they've learned their lesson because, well, I hope they have, because um, uh, the companies that didn't screw and the companies that did have a collaborative relationship with their suppliers are the ones that are actually taking the market share because they it affects the quality of the product and the, and the and the service delivery. Can you explain it, what an FMCG is for our audience? A fast-moving consumer goods ah. like Walmart. Okay. Yeah, um, and. Uh, uh, and I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying I approve what Walmart does, but I am impressed by the system of collaborative relationships. They came a bit late to it for what I like, but they have certainly they are right brained in the way they organize their network. And they understand the power of good relationships because they do have long term relationships with their suppliers. That's the one thing you get from them. It's going to be a hard life, but you've got that continuity. So, and and we never we never thought that deeply in the UK, 
and it, it, it affected us very badly because, uh, for example, um, Nissan came to the UK and started setting up in about 1981, I think it was, and in five years they were making and selling 2,000 cars a week in the UK and the biggest UK car manufacturer was making 700 cars a week. So in four years, they leapt to the top of the league and within five years, they were exporting 138,000 cars. They were exporting from the... So they were an enormous asset to the UK. Um, and guess what they came with? They came with good supplier relationships. Um, they came with uh, really good process control thinking. And they came with the intention of getting the best value from their workforce, uh, which they judged by how many, I don't know if you know this, but they judged their success, ongoing success, by how many um, worker improvement suggestions came out every month. Uh, and, they, and that was their criterion. That was their, like, their benchmark for seeing how well they were doing. Now, <laughs> the British wouldn't do that, I'm not, not for a second, because the workers just don't believe the British management would ever listen to them anyway. Mm. So they don't mm. uh, make suggestions. So all, all of these were, was, were, were kind of ignored by Britain. And that's what I, I kept saying to myself, what does it take? Uh, and, in fact, to make the Brits realize what the problem is, and I regret even to this day they don't realize that the problem is management. It's the management system they've got uh, which is depressing productivity. And they always insist on training the workers better or getting, them, <laughs> getting the workers. They never think the conditions we put them in and the way we, the way we reward them, the way we acknowledge them, respect them, and train them in process thinking um, could actually make a big difference. They don't do that. So, and I think that's across the UK and the, and the USA. I, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen the USA uh, doing much better in the way it treats its, uh, its, its supply chains and workforces, but you do have exceptions. Uh, Motorola tried really hard um, International Harvester failed really dismally. Uh, on the other hand, uh, John Deere um, are a great example. So it's just that these are always in the minority. Mm -hmm. and that's my and that's my my key issue. Yeah. So I set about trying to fix the supply chain and trying to uh, do it in a way which which demonstrated the value to the company. Uh, and it was interesting that while I was doing this, I, I could, could not do it in manufacturing. Uh, they didn't bite. Because one of the problems with manufacturing was that we had this, um, what I call, you know, there's the, I call it the ABCDE thing, but I'll come back to that later. But it was just, we were on acquisition paths where the A was for acquisition. They were, they were more interested in acquiring other companies um, than they were in investing in their own development processes. So, you know, we lost our motorcycle industry. We very nearly lost our largest um, high-tech industry, GKN, because it went on the acquisition spree. And we had this idea that um, being seen to be having a lot of money or a good balance sheet was more important than actually growing your market share because of the value you were adding to the customers. They didn't get that at all. And, and I'm afraid they, a lot of them still don't. So it was a big job. And what, what happened to me was uh, I wrote a couple of papers uh, and one of them was picked up because I'd met Dr. Deming and I realized that here was the answer. They, they absolutely, 
uh, when I when I read Out of the Crisis. You know, there were there were there were three <laughs> three in 1982 was a very significant year. Um, a the ozone layer was discovered ha- having a hole in it. Uh, B in the in the book writing we had three very interesting different books. We had um, Goldratt producing the first edition. He didn't call it the Gold, but it became the Gold. Mm-hmm. We had Peters Peters and Waterman producing their industrial bestseller, uh, and then and then and then in the background, quite quietly, was Deming, same year, producing Out of the Crisis. So we had three three gurus in a way, pointing the way for Western industry to go. And I don't know, I kind of looked at the results and I thought, well, um, they're not really going that way. And and I can only put that down to the financialization mentality that was happening. Yeah, it was people were counting the coins mm-hmm. rather than than and looking at the, the the increased value. Sorry, I've gone on there. No, uh, that's uh, that's interesting. And so the uh, the the one book was in search of excellence, and uh, in those three, um, let me take you back for just a second here. You you referenced the red blue game, and yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was exposed to that, I thought that was pretty fabulous. There was a backstory to it that you used to tell back in uh, the early eighties. But can you describe the game for everybody so that they they can understand yeah. what its intention was and how it worked? Okay, fine. Um, uh, it, it was originally called Prisoner's Dilemma, uh, and it was it was it goes right back to uh, the um, the uh, the mad mutually assured destruction uh, that emerged out of the out of the, the race, the, the, the atomic bomb race. And von Neumann, uh, the scientist, uh, put the prisoner's dilemma together, I believe, uh, to illustrate that if you go win-lose, lose-lose, then you eventually both you end up in mutually assured destruction. You both destroy each other. Um, and he used it uh, in order to just illustrate what they were doing. What I found uh, with Neil, but went on even to a greater extent, was it you could turn it into a decision-making game uh, and to illustrate the importance of relationships because I put money into it. So you had to pay to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was it illustrated, you had, there were, say, three or four teams, and the goal was to get the highest possible score and the team with the highest possible score provided everyone, every other team achieves their goal, would get all the money. Okay? Now, all this did was, now listen to that carefully, because what it's saying is you will win the prize if you have the highest score, the highest positive score, that is, providing everyone else is positive. Because the name of the game for your team is to get the highest positive score or to achieve a positive score even. So if anyone went into negative at the end of the game, there was no money available because you didn't meet the conditions. And that was the win-lose. And what it did was by about, there were 10 rounds in the game, by about the eighth, seventh or eighth round, people were going, oh my, oh my, I have to learn to trust and in order to trust, I've got to kind of make myself vulnerable and be prepared to lose a little bit in order to gain trust. Um, and that became a world beater. Everyone on, we've done 50,000 games now, I reckon. And in every case, wherever I've been, learning how to trust and learning to develop strategies for developing trust uh, became absolutely key and I use it for purchasing first of all to illustrate that you you need your supplier your supplier needs you so why do you come across antagonistically yeah that you you are interdependent so exercise that and what happened was that 
it worked very well. Um, and the money wasn't there so much as a gamble. It was there so much to show what the reward could be. Because uh, the tutor, I did, I always put in, if you put in $100, for example, I would put in $100 as an outsider. So that was the profit. Okay, and that became and that became the negotiation element. So, you know, if you said to me, all right, so what we'll do is if I play so that you can win, then we, we can split the profit. But because I took the biggest risk, I want the biggest share of the profit. And then your negotiation begins. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a fabulous game. And yeah, oh, I've heard you tell a story about using this with miners, a group of black miners and a group of white miners. Can you, yeah, yeah. can you tell us that uh, story? Yeah, sure. Um, Dr. Deming got it out of me at a conference. He pulled me up on the stage. Um, and he, 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 he just wanted to know uh, if the game was one which illustrated cooperation. And he wanted to know the extent to which this was possible. And the story was simply this, that I was working with... Um, some, I think it might have been Anglo-American miners, and they were mainly younger men, and all under 30, and sort of half were black and half were white because Anglo-American was try in South Africa, was now trying to get uh, more blacks um, through the system. And um, we played the game, and it's 10 rounds, and uh, the blacks all played the positive, it, the positive uh, choice was player red, it's called, the red, color red. Red, blue, mm -hmm. the color red. And they, for 10 rounds, they played red. And for 10 rounds, the whites played blue. So at the end of the day, um, the, the whites kind of had like plus 80, and the blacks had minus 80. And the, and the whites were very pleased. Um, because they had got a positive score and they had the highest positive score. And they were dumbfounded when I wouldn't give them the money because I said, actually, <laughs> it's your responsibility to make sure the other side doesn't fail either because uh, their goal is also to get a positive score. Oh, um, right. But, um, well, why didn't they... <laughs> The usual, why didn't they, why do they keep playing red then? Because that each time you played red, your, your negative score doubled, and they went, going, why did you play red? And the black school said, mm, we were trying to signal to you that we were wanted to cooperate. Stunned silence. Because the whites were so busy competing that they never saw that there was a possibility of a win-win. And they never thought about the impact on the other side. They were just delighted with the, in fact, delighted and quite bored that they were just getting all these positive scores. And um, it's funny that because there was, the silence lasted a long time. I said to them, well, um, you've got to decide. I've got the money. I don't want the money. You've, you do with it. And they said uh, to the black guys. And the black guy said, we don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want your money. <laughs> you, 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 and, their, and their big discussion uh, went on over lunch and dinner. About and then they got to the point where the where the white guy said, "Yeah, we do. You know, we do have a problem. We don't see um, often enough that the other side. We need the other side. Yeah. Now, in real life, they said underground when you're working, you absolutely know that. You know, I know that. The, and in in the army, because they fought together in the in the bush war, blacks and whites, and they in the army, but they couldn't see it applying." in the most obvious situation where someone has something of value, but you, neither of you gets value unless you both get value. See what mm -hmm. I mean? So there was a real learning point and uh, Deming, Deming thought it was so funny. 
He then said to me, uh, yeah, he said, I, you know, when I, when I think of that game, he said, I realized that the one thing that I've underestimated when I came back from Japan to the USA was um, the extent where people don't understand cooperation in the West. He said, the whole, and he, and he said in that big voice of his, he said, competition is all they understand and competition kills companies uh and and he and he was right so so i think at that from that point onward he realized that what had to change was the leadership because it was the leadership that built the culture so he spent the rest of his life from about nine that was 89 for the next three years he just did everything in his power you know, at the age of 90, it's hard to believe, running around just trying to get the message home about let's stop the competition. Let's learn how to collaborate. And for God's sake, stop the competition inside your own company. Uh, clearly, you know, uh, it never really got home. I don't think it was sad, but it never did. Because if you think of the highest performing company, in the States, Microsoft, for example, uh, they allowed one of their CEOs to, to put a policy in called stack ranking, where they, they made people compete with each other uh, for, for, I don't know, for being better or something. And in a company which relies on the value of innovation, and innovation relies on sharing, developing stuff together and great teamwork. That was a nonsensical thing to do. And even Forbes magazine went, this is stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, he found he and the HR director both left. And there's no more stack ranking. Uh, but, but Microsoft lost ground over those three years. They lost ground to other companies coming up behind them. So... I think it's a huge issue, this this thing about competition and the way it's encouraged by the top management systems. Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears just a little bit. Uh, I want to ask about your first exposure to HPT, human performance technology, or evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or however you refer to this. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Neil Rackham. You mentioned uh, Deming. Um, but, but where did you first get exposed to this idea of improving things and using evidence as, as the basis for practices for making these improvements? Uh, that's, a, um, that's a good question. Um, I, think, I think it was it was the very fact, again, going back to Neil Rackham, when you saw behavior change um, and when the behavior change led to a better outcome uh, and, and that was classical. I think negotiation was a very good uh, negotiation was a very good arena to put it in because um, your skilled negotiator, if you look at a negotiation, it has three main phases. It has the, the opening phase where basically you are giving and seeking information, but it's always it's always um, at one arm, one one level removed, because what you're trying to find out is is the person serious? Do they have the mandate? Is it within my limits? Is it? And then eventually you decide. Well, is it worth going on with the negotiation? Uh, and your skilled negotiator, if they look at it and they think, well, it's outside my parameters, they say to the other party, hey, I think we should just stop now. And maybe you need to go back and talk to your bosses and that. But uh, and and that's a very wise thing to do, because the average negotiator uh, you know, keeps on trying to make the thing happen. And what happens is you get frustrated, and you and then of course you've got to recover from all that. Because whereas the skilled negotiator doesn't let it get to that point, he just backs off and says, "That's fine," and we'll meet again if you if you have a change of mind whenever you're ready. If they do decide to carry on, then they get into what is called the bargaining phase. Now, this is what people confuse as the negotiation. They don't see that it's a much bigger system than that. 
And in the bargaining phase, that's where you do have a bit of, you know, conflict. It's allowable. You can you can argue about stuff. You can try and put stuff down. Where do you get that information from and that? But if you go through that whole process, and it's testing not just the resolve of the other party, but it's also testing, is there common ground? Is there really common ground? And if there is, and if you're looking at, begins to move towards the solution phase, then your skilled negotiator says, makes another decision. Are we close enough in our, in our common ground and in our, in our common view of this to move into agreement, the agreement phase? And if they do, if they say, yeah, I think we're okay to do this, we, then it's so interesting because the agreement phase has a real problem for people who've been trained in the old-fashioned selling, which was, I believe, called ABC, always be yes. closing. Okay? So as soon as they saw what they call a buying signal, <laughs> which is, you know, coming to agreement, they would grab it. And they'd go, okay, so then, uh, and they'll close. And, of course, if this is a, if this is a $25 million deal that's going to, be lasting at least five years, your your other party's gonna go, hang on, whoa, that hang on, you didn't understand. And it actually pushes you away from each other. So it's the worst training you can give a negotiator is to send them on the traditional sales course. But what happens is in the behavior change is that your skilled negotiator starts doing something called testing understanding. So every third or fourth thing they say are things like, are you saying that we can do this and this uh, in time for that? Is that what you're telling me? Okay, are you saying, and you hear this again and again and again, and what happens is the agreement phase actually lasts almost as long as the other two phases put together. Why? Because the skilled negotiator is not thinking about agreement. He's thinking about implementation. So every phase of the way he's doing two things, he's getting the issues right by both parties and he's working out, is there enough trust between us so that that trust will carry on after the negotiation and that this guy can go back to his company and, the, and have enough uh, kind of belief in the agreement to push for it to really happen. Uh, and I, I spent many a night talking to these people about that. And the number of times these guys would go back and they, they would say, no, no, that's not, no, that's not good enough. No, three years is too long a contract. Or, and the, at that point, that's when your skilled negotiator just gave up. He went, uh, he, and then you'd often hear him say, well, you tell them then. I'm not going to tell mm -hmm. them. Uh, because he knew that that trust was just going to be broken, and he didn't want to be part of that. That was, that so, was one of my big takeaways from the win-win negotiations program and my exposure to you and what you taught about that and what Neil Rackham taught about the spin-selling methodologies was win-win. Yeah. And the everyone that was successful was really looking further ahead past the agreement, as you said, to the success yeah. of the implementation. Uh, yeah. You yeah. referenced several of these behavior uh, analysis uh, types of communication. You mentioned seeking information, giving information, yeah. and testing understanding, which were yeah. W yeah. which are some of the ones that I borrowed and have been using since those days and have incorporated mm. those kinds of things into training programs that I've created because this yeah, is yeah, basic yeah. communications, uh, giving information, mm. uh, making statements, uh, seeking information, asking questions, but but testing understanding was so powerful. It And, mm. and mm. announcing that, well, let me test my understanding here. So prefacing yep. your behavior often yep. caught, you know, so that gave the other party a chance to, stop and go, oh, something different is coming here. Let me, you know, be prepared to be receptive to it or defensive yeah, to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So what more can you share with us about some of uh, the behavior analysis um, methods that you used and the kinds of behaviors that you were 
looking for? Because you actually sat and had people ticking off the number of times that th certain things happen yeah. and develop profiles yeah. for, yeah. you know, what good communications behaviors uh, look like at the beginning of a process, in the middle of the process, yeah. and at the end of the process. Yeah. Okay, well, can I step right back, Len, and just say, well, that, I think uh, the best field to look at that in is uh, is in construction. Yes. Um, uh, I was uh, I was pulled into construction by accident. I wrote a paper, and Shell and Exxon said, "Yeah, we need we need this kind of stuff." I wrote about the need for collaboration. It was, it was called cooperation works, but it's hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, and they brought me onto the into, into their into their oil fields in the in the North Sea, and uh, I was sitting. You know, I, I I was sitting on oil platforms. Uh, and, and listening, so I wasn't just listening in a training situation. I was talking to people about it. And I remember there was a, there was a contractor, uh, a, a, an executive. I mean, it was two in the morning on Brent Charlie in the, in the OC. And we were chatting. And he said to me, look, he said, what Shell has to understand, he said, is that the earlier they involve me, in their in their maintenance program and not just with the replacement side of it he says the better value i can give them he said if they could just get that through their heads and between us we drew a diagram um which was called early involvement and it just said that uh and again this comes back to this western culture in britain the way they, they ran projects was you'd 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 send out for tenders, you'd take the lowest cost tender, you'd bring them in, you'd tell them what the specifications were, you'd tell them what nuts and bolts to buy, who the suppliers were, etc. And in the end, all he had to do, so-called, was put together, put together all of this in, in, in building a, let's say, not a platform, but let's say we're building a, a ship, a small ship. The only value he could add would be um, maybe finding some way of doing it slightly faster. But of course, if it required any risk, he was not going to do that. So what he got, even if he could look at the diagram, look at the blueprint and say, actually, this is not really what's needed. You need these, you need these kind of motors, you need that and that. It was too late because the tender had solidified the whole damn thing. So what this guy said to me, you pull me in early, he said, I will add value right at the beginning if you get me at the concept stage. And I found this out because on one of the mining companies, they were going from uh, the under, they were going to underground mining from an open cast mining. You know, when it gets too steep, mm -hmm. you, you go underground. And they, and this company uh, had, des had designed the underground mine and everything and they, and then we, we came along and said, actually, um, we think this is a good a good chance to get your contractors involved, and we help manage it. And they were skeptical, but within about four meetings, the contractors had said, the headgear isn't right. It's not the headgear. What? You don't need two shafts. The ventilation shaft you can now do is in a single shaft within the main shaft. You can use raised boring to do that, and, and you could see that. The client's jaw drop, and they, in those three meetings, they took two hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment out of the whole process, and they didn't get any of it. They just took it out because they're engineers. They they you know they there to provide solutions. They like to work things through. Anyway, what they very bad at though is running meetings. <laughs> yeah. So so what we were doing is we were saying, okay, guys, you had this meeting. And you know that the 11 behaviors, and of the 11 behaviors, 80% of it had been taken up with giving information. And they go, uh, uh, yeah, so, okay, let's just test out this information that you give. Uh, how useful was it to this side? And the guy just said, oh, particularly from the client, you see. And the guy said, um, not very, because we knew that already. No, we, we'd read the design spec. We'd read the tender document. We knew all about that. So 
So how did you find the meeting? Well, really boring, actually. <laughs> Anyway, and, 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 and we, we, th we said to them, okay, now what you're going to have to do is this. A chairman. We're going to appoint a proper chairman in the meeting, and it's not going to be the senior guy in the meeting. It's someone who has experience of chairing. Uh, and then so they, 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 we said to people, okay, do you, do you, are you on rotary? Do you ever do any work for this or do that outside? And you'd find these people who chaired meetings, either in the church or wherever. Pull them in, and then you would watch them for the first 20 minutes and then stop the meeting and say, okay, can I just ask you, how's the meeting going? And nine times out of ten, people say, oh, this is better. You know, this is working. So what's the chairman doing? And then we point out the chairman was doing two things. One, he was testing understanding. Two, he was bringing people in. And three, he was summarizing. So people weren't overloaded. They'd go for 15 minutes, then he'd say, well, okay, so what we've discussed is this and this and this, and it looks like we're heading in this direction. Is that how all of you see it? Yeah? And, and it was making visible the invisible. And you could see these engineers, you know, they were clocking it now. They're going, oh, okay, yeah, I understand that. Um, and then uh, we would say, if the chairman wasn't doing that, we'd then show him that, I, I'm sorry, here are the chairing behaviors. What you're doing is you're reverting to type and just giving information and proposals. That's not bringing the meeting along. We, we, were, we were really using it as a, as, a, as, an, as a, what would you call it, um, interjection mm -hmm. to stop the meeting and set it on its course again. Because, you know, when you're running a project, you have a lot of meetings. And if the meetings are bad meetings, you don't want to go to the meetings. We, we found that by giving them feedback on this basis, the meetings were cut in half. Because a lot of the meetings are meetings because what is agreed at the last meeting hasn't been carried out. Okay? Because the guys were sick of it. And they, and they couldn't wait to get home. So those behaviors changed the whole nature of the meeting. Completely. Um, and also the, 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 the people became confident in their own behaviors. So eventually we could say to them, you don't need a chairman. Yeah, It's up to you to test understanding now. It's not the chairman's job to do it all the time. It's up to you. And, and as this happened and, and the, the behaviors became more and more sophisticated, uh, the trust and the confidence in each other just grew exponentially. And that was the power of those behaviors. Um, and it was really an intervention strategy. I didn't have to write it up on the wall or anything like that. They kind of got it. So for them, for me, that was where the, the behavior came in. But you've got to remember that the original purpose was because when you involve people early, when you involve them early, you have to use these teamwork behaviors. You have to use them. If you just do the same old, same old, they're going to go, well, I don't know what I'm doing at this meeting then. Yeah? So, and, and by the way, that, that early involvement strategy, um, the, the value it added, I reckon, to, to the meetings generally and to the project was about 30% more than they would have got otherwise because two things happened. Uh, and I saw this very strongly in when they were building um, a big sewage plant. Two things happened. One, in the old days, remember, they, the, the contractor, if they saw the client had made a slip up, they wouldn't say anything because they could get, they, they, they could get, uh, uh, they could get uh, advantage by giving him a letter saying that's not in the spec. It's going to cost you X amount of money because that's not in the spec. And that sets up a... That, that whole conflict relationship as well. In the early involvement, because now the in engineers engaged, talking to each other as engineers, they would say, hang on, hang on, if you do that, well, let me give you a little example. Uh, that In a very simple, we did a lot of work with Sainsbury's. And in, in one of the meetings, um, one of the 
it was the, it was the guy who put the, the roof on. He finally plucked up courage to say to the to the meeting, look, um, I know I'm just a little supplier and a tiny bit of business, but actually what you're doing is you're laying the car park, tarmac, before I can put the roof on. All of my cranes are caterpillars. They are caterpillar tracks. They will chew up, they will chew up the car park. Mm-hmm. And it is only because he felt safe in that environment that he could say that. And the chairman said, my God, he said, are you right? I forgot. Oh, so he said to the, um, the guy who was doing the, the car park, can you do the car park later? Yeah, of course I can. I'll just change X and Y around. Done. And, and so both conflict and, uh, and value, the conflict avoided and value added. Great. Uh, let's go back to Deming. We've talked a little bit about uh, the behavior analysis uh, that you learned from Neil Rackham. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, Deming and his influence on you. Um, he has his 14 points, and and one of the one of the points was ending the practice of awarding vendors on price tag only. Um, yeah. But but what are what are some of your other takeaways uh, in, 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 in how Deming had an impact on your approaches and practices? Okay. Um, well, the first thing is that I was delighted uh, because actually what you, just, what you said was the avoid, you know, stop paying on the basis of the price tag. Um, that is the longest point. That's got 14 pages. Mm-hmm. He wrote 14 pages in... Uh, out of the crisis on that, and I was really thrilled by that. Judy. That was that was a, that was really good, um, and we had a lot of discussion about about the about the upstream um, behaviors. So, one, you know, he was a he was a he was a listener, Demi, but in his and. and and the second thing he did, which I respected him tremendously for, he gave credit wherever it was due. If you read his books, you'll always see thanks to so-and-so, thanks to so-and-so, and thanks for this suggestion. He was a really, really, really uh, great example uh, for that sort of thing. In fact, I would say to anyone, if you just read Deming's introduction to his Out of the Crisis and nothing else, uh, you will be on the road to understanding how organizations really work because he's got two things in there. The one is what he calls the chain reaction, whereby, you know, basically right first time and guess what? You get it right first time, You the costs go down, the, the, um, the costs go down, the value goes up, the innovation goes up as well. Uh, confidence increases and continuous improvement can happen. And, and he illustrates it beautifully. And that's the first diagram in his book. The second diagram is, of course, looking at it as a system, looking at the organization as a system. And that one has really, really helped me um, in, in a lot of my work when I'm working with, uh, particularly with the um, National Health Service and um, the social care system, uh, because when you when you finally grasp uh, an organization as a system, you realize it's a system within a system, uh, and it's it's system thinking. Even though the let's take the NHS, the National Health Service NHS, the National Health Service, eighty five percent of the demand into the National Health Service comes out of social care. It doesn't come out of people having car accidents or getting flu. Or it's out of social care. People who are disadvantaged, living in bad communities, all that sort of thing. So straight away, when you start system thinking and you analyze the nature of demand, you go, well, actually, what's happening is NHS is picking up the tab for us not paying enough attention to the communities, the families, the indigents, etc., 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 and you know what could cost maybe 
$50 for a visit at home, if that person comes, has to come into hospital, that's $1,000 a day. And because you understand how the systems interact. The other, the other element which I think is, is important is to help people understand the system where it starts. And certainly the, the big thing that I found that Deming and a friend of mine, John Seddon, uh, have put out, which I think is great, is understanding the nature of demand. And to understand the nature of demand has been lost. People don't really do it. What do I mean by that? So, for example, um, one of the things that happens in, in social care is these guys come in and they, they're on the dole and they're saying, and they're saying things like, I, 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 I can't pay my rent. I want you to help me pay my rent because I can't pay it. And we're going, well, actually, we can't help you pay your rent. We're, we don't have the money for that. What we can take you to is an advice. He said, no, I've been to an advice center. Okay, now, that's where you stop. Because you say, okay, why can't you pay your rent? Well, because my, my check hasn't come from the Social Security office. So, actually, that's what is, that's what is called um, failure demand. He's in trouble not because of anything he's done, but because of something outside the system that that is causing this to happen. So then, then you go to the social security people and you say, well, what's going on with these checks? And then you do your classic, how many times does it happen? Where does it happen? Et cetera, et cetera. And that, that kind of thinking, I wouldn't have got anywhere else but from Deming. And for a doctor, as you know, one of the most expensive things it's for a patient to be readmitted. Yeah, they sent home and it's not working out and they come back then they're sicker and it takes a lot longer, more bed, etc. So what happens here is with the doctor, we found out that when you, when you chatted to the doctor about their, their system, their system they saw, it started when the patient was admitted. That's when they saw the responsibility began. So the patient's admitted for whatever reason. And it finishes when the patient is discharged. Okay, so if you think about that, then basically what often happened was two things. One, that the doctor would look at someone at the weekend, it's Friday, and that's a young guy, and he's been in hospital for a week, and he wants to go home, and he's looking a lot better. And the doctor would say, okay, I'll tell you what, you can go home at lunchtime today. And the nurse will go, oh, my God, because the doctor hasn't realized that the home may not be ready for him to go to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So his mom and dad both work. Uh, there's, there's, there's no facilities in the home in case he gets sick. There's, you know, the, he, may, he may have a broken leg or something. Who's going to help him around? And so the nurse is going, uh, when the doctor's gone, she goes to the young man. She says, um, "Conquer home." There's um, your mom and dad. She, you can go home tomorrow because your mom and dad won't be at work because it's a Saturday. But you can't go home tonight. And very often, the patient gets sicker. They get disappointed, and if they're old people, they actually ninety percent chance of them staying another another in the hospital because there's not enough attention paid to where the system starts and ends. So we had to train the doctors to, to look at is where your responsibility, does it really just finish where it's discharged or is it from home to home, not just from the hospital entrance to the hospital exit. And as soon as that happens, and that's Deming again, the guy goes, oh, my God, yeah, you're right. And you can apply it in so many situations. You know, on the mines, for example, the black miners – uh, of taxi did. They used taxis to bring him to work. But the taxis are driven by lunatics in South Africa. And so they die in the taxis. So, so you've got to say to the manager, hey, hey, you know, your system actually starts when the guy leaves home. You've got to look after him. And now they have their own taxis. They provide their own buses for their own workers. 
so they can see how powerful that system thinking can be. Thank you. Can you shift to your story about your work in Hong Kong? That always fascinated yeah. me, and so I'd like to capture that if okay. I can. Okay, well, I, I, as I said to you, construction, uh, construction really was in a bad way in the early 90s uh, in, in this country, a really bad way. Um, there were 200,000 jobs lost. It was 1% of GDP. The profitability was less than 2%. Uh, and it was just basically 50% of what was uh, constructed was over budget. And if it was a government construction, it was sometimes 10 times over budget. And not and not because the contractor's fault, because the politicians kept changing their mind and changing the design going on, and stuff like that. So I was, they'd seen the work that I'd done in the North Sea with um, the maintenance programs. And and Sir Michael Latham was commissioned by the, by the Prime Minister to fix construction. And he took my work and he introduced me to the construction community. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I just love these guys. Um, and what happened was that we ran work, we designed and ran workshops where we get them early involvement, but we'd also get them to establish a trusting relationship first, quickly. Um, and then I always said to, uh, to the client, please don't use tenders, because your, your tender is a, is a device that makes that creates conflict. You know? And the guy's going to come into the lowest cost, and you know he's going to try and buy the business, and you know you're, you're going to pay for it, not him. You're going to pay for it. Anyway, the word got out, and I was working with a the British Rail extension to the to to Dover, um, the government, in their wisdom, says he sarcastically, because I know Americans don't get sarcasm, <laughs> okay, or satire. All right, they 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 they, they built a channel tunnel, so we had the the trains that ran from Paris to London, under the sea. Brilliant huh? channel tunnel. By the way, that was within two years of the construction starting. It was already two years late and 1.5 billion over budget because of the, of the relationships, the competitive nature and the class systems way that the MD was running, they had to replace him with an American from Bechtel, which I didn't like, but he, he made it work. John Nehote, his name was. And um, anyway, so we were doing this, uh, and what happened, we, they designed, the British designed this wonderful program, and the trains, the fast, we had a high-speed train in London, which did 140 miles an hour, and the French had a high-speed train that did 170 miles an hour, and what happened was we decided not to build a high-speed track the 30 miles between London and Dover to save money. So <laughs> passengers would come from France in the high-speed train, stop at Dover, get onto a train that did 60 miles an hour, <laughs> and we were the laughing stock. And we're losing money. So we decided at much greater cost now to build this extension. And so I was, uh, we, we, were, we were there to, to, to design and help run it in terms of the relationships. And the guy who was the, the commercial director, the head, head of purchasing and commerce, he went to Hong Kong. And on the 3rd of January, 1999, I had a phone call in my house saying, I want you to come out to Hong Kong. We have this huge uh, question. I think I think partnering, which is what you've done with us on the other rail programs, can solve it. So bring your team out. Anyway, I, I've got funny. I was looking at my passport today. I flew out on the third and came back on the fifth, so <laughs> all the way to Hong Kong. Um, and I flew out and I met these two bright young engineers, project man, heads of project, one English, one Chinese. And they said, we've been looking at this partnering, we've researched it, and we think that the problem we've got can be solved by partnering. What is the problem? The problem, he said, was we have budgeted $4.8 billion to, to create a railway line into the inland territories because Hong Kong is so congested. So we're going to build this 13-kilometer line, and we're going to have five, four new stations. But each new station is going to be not just a station. It's going to be apartments shopping center all in one uh, tremendously good idea and it's underground it's the first time it was all the way with it was underground 
It was called the Mass Transit Railway Corporation and their underground project. But they said, this is 1999, they said the uh, East Asia has had a a real currency run. Uh, We had the Thai barters collapse. And so we've got the bids in and the bids are all below 4.8 billion. Way below. It's something like the bids have come in at three, at 4.1 billion or something. And what we think they're doing is they're buying the business. And that means that they will go out of business during the life of the project, which means we'll be late, which means in China that is not ever done. You do not lose face like that. All right. So he said, but they said, we think through partnering, we can actually get the truth out of these guys, reestablish it and go for it. Because they were all, they were all by government decree, they were all tenders, lowest cost tender contracts. So we said, okay, the first thing we need, now, and I ran a project, I ran the, uh, I got the directors together, and I said, you guys need to understand what I'm trying to do, and I played red blue with them, and after three hours of red blue, they went, okay, we know what you're trying to do now. <laughs> so, um, and then we. We, we did the same. We had a big workshop for the heads of the projects, got all the head, heads of the contracts together. There were 12, 12, con- 12 contracts, uh, 14 contractors, five languages, and 24 mini projects within this big project. Got them together and said, okay, guys, we don't believe you. We want to put everything on the table, look at it, and just have a long, hard talk about it and make sure this thing gets done on time. Because that's what matters. So they got down to it, uh, and they looked at it, and the project went from 4.1 billion. So it was 4.8 billion first, went from 4.8 to 4.1, and that's when they they got suspicious about them buying the business. They sat on all together with the MTRC guys, and it came, and they looked at it again, they went, oh, 3.5 billion. It actually went down even further. And there was nothing that the management could fault it. They said, well, that makes sense. So we spent the next three, uh, one, two, two, two and a half years with these guys working in, in, in just in teams, applying the Deming principles, looking at processes, and sitting in, and this is important, these guys are engineers. So you have your meetings where they are. So we had meetings in the tunnels under the sea. We had meetings when the when the when uh, when the stuff is being manufactured on site and things like that, and the insistence was that best person for the job doesn't matter what their rank is, you go to the best person for the job. Uh, do we have time for a quick story on that? Okay, because because what we what you discovered is the different cultures, the country different, and the French are very very autocratic, so it's the boss makes all the decisions. And <laughs> there were two crane drivers, one from the French company and one from the Australian company, uh, two cranes, and they were actually could swing over each other's fences. And so they, each time it looked like they were going to do it, the French driver had to go down and speak to his boss, and his boss would go up again and speak to the boss of the Australian company, <laughs> and, then, and then they'd waste three, four hours. And so the, the, managing, the guy who is the managing director of the project for the whole of MTRC was a New Zealander, Russell Black. He went, this is crazy. And he said to this guy, why do you do this? He said, well, I, all my decisions I must refer back to Paris. So he said, right. He said, tomorrow you and I are going to get on a plane and go to Paris. And then Russell was a big rugby playing New Zealander with gray hair, big guy. <laughs> And I, I, this is a, this may be apocryphal, but I think it's true. He and the and the project manager walked into the managing director's office in Paris, and Russell said, "I'm Russell Black. This this is the project we're doing." And he says, "If you want to manage the project, you come out to Hong Kong. Otherwise, he makes the decisions. You got that?" And the guy went, "Uh, okay." <laughs> <laughs> And that's how they behaved. It was great. And they went back, and every time there was a problem with the cranes crossing, the two drivers would phone each other up and say, okay, your turn now, I'll back off for half an hour, and guess what? They saved five hours a day. 
on the claim. So it was that kind of mentality. In that it was fantastic. Anyway, this continued, and the number of the number of letters of exchange, you know, complaints and that just went down to like one percent of what it would have been. And the project eventually, um, and this is important, finished four months early. And. $1.5 billion under budget, under the revised budget, not the original budget, $1.5 billion, because they had, they cooperated, they had the competence to manage the, the details of the meetings and that, the, the behaviors, and they had early involvement. Um, and um, it is, the, the last thing point I'll make, it is classic that the business press never commented on it. Now, the, uh, one of the great successes of any project, I bet you half the guys who listened to this video never heard of the, the Chung Kwan Oh extension of the MTRC 1999 to 2002 because the business press didn't, they prefer to talk about the conflicts and the late runnings and the overruns and all that kind of stuff. And one of the issues that I have with business, the business press and the, and the universities is they use the wrong examples. Mm -hmm. They don't talk about how successful Chrysler was in its, with the supply chain. You know, when they saved one and a half billion a year in 91, 92, 93. They don't talk about that. They talk about problem, uh, conflict resolution and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm, yeah, I'm pleased to talk about Hong Kong. Yes, that, yeah. that, that is one of my favorite stories of from your work uh, that, that I've hardly been able to keep up with it over these uh, past uh, almost 40 years. So, so yeah. you are yeah. known and you work in the areas of collaboration, cooperation, partnerships with early involvement. You were influenced by Neil Rackham and behavior analysis. You were influenced by Deming. So I'd like to make a shift yep. here and to help our audience um, uh, who are interested in these kinds of uh, approaches to getting work done. Um, are there any particular, you've named, you've named Deming's book Out of the Crisis, but are there, are there any other people or articles or books that you would say, if you really want to know more about this, you should go look mm. at these people, these articles, these books. Can, can, do you have a short list that you can give us? Yep. I have uh, any book by a chap called John Seddon, S-E-D-D-O-N, particularly when it comes to the public sector. Yes. Um, I, and and that's where I'm going to work. My, all my work now is in that public because, you know, um, and in America, it's the same issue you have. If the public sector giving its basic services isn't working properly, then as far as I'm concerned, you don't have a democracy. Yeah? Because a democracy means, for me, everyone has equal uh, uh, facilities to the basic needs. That's energy, that's water, that's education, that's health. Um, and uh, that's where John Seddon works. So if, you in, if you're in, in the public sector, then John Seddon's your man. Um, the other one, you just... Go back and read, go back and read Deming, please. I've read the book about 40 times and I'm still, it's like reading the Bible. You're still going, going wow, oh, that speaks to me again, you know. So go and read both his books, um, Out of the Crisis and The New Economics. That's, that's important. Um, unfortunately, my book is, is, is a bit outdated now, but there are bits in it which I still like. Uh, that's Beyond Negotiation. Mm -hmm. But it, that was written in 1989. But there are bits in it which are, I think have still got some useful information. Um, I think... What other books? Well, and there is uh, this, this uh, article, and I'm going to put this in the blog post, but cooperation works, but it's hard work. So I, oh, I oh, intend that, to that, share that. Yeah. I've got I've got I've got a lot of articles uh, that I've written about the public sector yes. as well, using SPC. Mm -hmm. um, so I can, uh, yeah, that, that's 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 important. It's called I call it the, I call it the new economics, um, because I worked out that our government every time our government changes its policy on the NHS, 
it costs something like 1.2 billion in waste. Mm. Um, so I'm 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 collating all the data on that, and I'm showing it statistically how it happens. So well, if you yeah, will so share I'm, those articles with me, I will share them uh, with others. That, sure. Uh, uh, we'll point people sure. to the uh, blog post uh, in the uh, on the YouTube video site. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's, sorry, there's one book just yes. come out by uh, by a chap called Brown, and it's called Tragedy and Challenge. Um, and it is it's it's he was he was a guy who was a very successful um, MD of uh, GKN uh, GKN at one stage. But he had a great career in running big companies, top of the big companies, and he just cannot cannot tell you how badly run the British management is. And in this book, it explains it all. But if you're an engineer or a, or a manufacturer, someone like that, you'll love the book. Okay. Tragedy and Challenge. Thank you. His name is... Mm. So uh, you knew this was coming. Um, so I want to ask you if you... Uh, so to keep, provide examples to others... Uh, yes, this is yeah. about your 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do. And I normally set this up by saying you're at a, a neighborhood party and someone that's new to the neighborhood comes up to you and says, John, what do you do? What's your 30-second uh, elevator speech? That uh, uh, I'm, I, I make people conscious of the extent to which the system they're in at work stops them having a decent life. And the more they can recognize what the system really looks like. So if it's got bonuses in it or targets in it, then those are the two things you, you pick out straight away as a corrupt system. So my job is to make you understand and find out exactly where it's corrupt, how it's corrupt, and actually protest about it. Excellent example. Thank you. As a lifelong learner, which you obviously are, can you share mm -hmm. with us your current focus or next focus for your own learnings? Where, where, where are you going next in that? And are you continuing to write about any of that? Anything that you can share with us? Um, yeah, I'm, well, I'm continuing to write about it. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm going into more deeply now, uh, yeah, yeah, it's hard to think about it, but what I'm, what I'm, what I'm going into more deeply now is back into values. It's it's what happens. What's happened to the values? Um, so someone asked me the question. They said to me, "I was having dinner with a, a young guy that I've been coaching. He's a very bright guy, and he said to me, tell me why did the hippies turn into dictators when they got to your age?'" He said, "Yeah. So all these guys who were young hippies are now these guys who are cracking the whip uh, over over so many companies." And, you know, and taking bonuses and saying it being efficient and that. So I'm trying to understand much more what has happened to the human character. Um, why, why would, I suppose I would like to say, why would anyone need to earn more than a million dollars a year? I, I don't get it. I really don't. And I've had, I've had a lot of money. I don't get it. So it's a, it's a fundamental human question. Uh, and the, the, I think the other one is um, I'm a supporter of what they call universal basic, basic income. I really agree with that concept. I think if you want to give people a degree of freedom and if you really care about the people that you as a politician in charge of, you would pay them at least $1,000 a month just for being a citizen in your country. Uh, and then they're free to stay at home, look after the kids if they want to, or pay child care out of that 100000 because they want to go and work, or the husband can do it, or whatever. And I think this is something that's coming and is going to come big time in the next. I think you've got a, a presidential candidate called Yang who pushes yes, that. Yes, he just dropped out of the race, but that was one of his uh, platform items. Well, uh, I support him 100% in that. And so I'm, I'm working on that with a lady, um, a lady economist, uh, Frances Hutchinson. Um, and that's absorbing me. So I've got, I've got a lot to do. So you you mentioned earlier that your your focus now is the public sector, public services, and that. Uh, so yep. besides the basic or universal basic income, what are, what what are you doing in those areas? Are you are you actively involved in that or intending to? 
go that route? I'm. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm. I'm a socialist. So one of I've got. A, I'm in charge of an organisation for Yorkshire called the Socialist Health Association, mm -hmm. and we we pick up where the government is using, in particular, where the government is using uh, issues like funding and efficiency and that, uh, and we 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 produce a data which shows how what a negative impact is having on the lives of patients and people in care, and then we publish that, and we also demonstrate, uh, for example, um, where it's necessary. But in a way, I'm a tutor to these young doctors and nurses and that, or just not young, but anyone who, so I can point out to them, there's no point demonstrating about this unless you've got the data. Unless you can say to, unless you can say to the doctor, Look, if we if we have to work a seven day week, uh, the same number of patients will die as as ever. We won't save any lives, but what will happen is that you'll burn out the doctors and nurses. And already we are short of. Did you know this? We are short of twenty thousand doctors, and forty thousand nurses, because the government hasn't recruited properly, hasn't trained properly, and because doctors and nurses are getting burnt out. And you're having the same issue in the states. Very true. Let me shift again here uh, to my next question. I'm looking to talk about terminology and our language. So uh, what I'm asking is, is there a favorite performance improvement or quality improvement term or phrase that you would define for us? Perhaps you found that uh, people are misusing it and, and you want to put your spin on it. What, what do you have for us? Cutting costs increases costs. Yes. Cutting costs increases costs. Okay, what's your definition of that? I mean, it's maybe self-explanatory, okay, but okay. Uh, fill in the blank. Yeah, well, okay. So, um, if you if cutting unit costs, in other words, um, by, by um, let's, let's take something very simple, like, like a call center. Mm -hmm. So... What you don't want to do is to employ too many people, so you, you you make them work as efficiently as possible, and that means limiting the limiting the calls to say maximum of two minutes, preferably one minute. And then you have a big board which shows how you're doing, okay? And so that's to cut costs, you see, because you limit the calls, you get more calls in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, what happens then is. When you analyze the data, and this is what John Seddon has done very well indeed, analyze the data, you'll find that uh, where the call centers, where a lot of the calls are increasing, and you're thinking, well, okay, we're getting more and more calls, so we need more staff, or we need to make the staff finish their calls in one minute. When you analyze the call, the calls that you're getting more of are what they call failure calls. So it's a person phoning back saying, you didn't resolve my problem for me last time. You cut me off, uh, or um, I can't. I couldn't get through to the next line because this happened. And and so this, the the person who's uh, handling the call can't give any value to that person because they've now suddenly generated three more failure calls. So in fact, when you look at it, the reason your number of calls are increasing is because your failures are increasing. So if you employ more staff to cope with the 40% the, the more calls, all you're doing is employing more people to generate more failure calls. And that means, when, and, and one of the things that John's worked out, uh, is that if that's costing the call centers uh, about, I would say, 80% of their profit goes into, goes into that. So what you're doing, by cutting costs there, you're increasing aggregate costs. And that's what I meant by yes, that. Systems, th uh, systems and, thinking uh, would uh, uncover systems thinking those. Cuts. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, w w the, the way you solve that is you get the manager. You get the manager to sit in on the calls and trace them and follow them and map them. And and, the, and then they, they have a nervous breakdown somewhere in between the two things when they see what what, what pain they're causing their staff and the, and the callers. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, before I wrap up, what have we missed? Uh, it's been a long time since you and I have had any interaction. Uh, we, we talked in January a month ago. 
Uh, before yeah, and before yeah. that, it was I think 39, 38 oh. years. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> it's been yeah, a long time. Yeah, um, I I was always intrigued back in the uh, 81, 82 with the the win win negotiations as I experienced it and and yeah, your yeah. teachings along that line. And I think uh, capturing it with collaboration and and cooperation and partnerships was was all part of yep. that. Um, I'm, I'm yeah, happy to yeah. hear uh, additional labels for that because hopefully that'll be the hook that other people's ne- other people need in order to begin to explore uh, your work and explore some of the people who have influenced you and who you respect. Um, so before I segue into the the final question, uh, seeking uh, words of wisdom for others who are new to the, entering the field. What else about your career and what you've learned might we touch on, or have we touched on at all, and, and, and we should just go to a wrap? Um, I, I, th- I, think, I think we've got, uh, I, think the thing, I think the thing that I would, if I, if I learned about it earlier, <clears throat> And this is, I would really have spent more time fighting this bonus culture, um, fighting the the connection of bonuses to the um, profitability, so-called, of the company and the share price, both of which emerged from Harvard, by the way. Uh, Harvard has a lot to answer for, for some of the professors there, what things they've said, um, because that is the single most corrupting influence i think in business today um we we that and commission that but, but both it's both the same sort of thing you, targets commissions bonuses get rid get rid of those and i should have been working on those structural issues uh 15 years ago and i wasn't so i that's 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 an area that i'm still alerting people to but uh, it's an area I regret. I didn't. I didn't pay enough attention. Are to. there are there people in particular that uh, that we can point others to to begin to look at that? Because I think that goes hand in hand with the uh, re- uh, forced rankings that you talked about that Microsoft yeah. was doing and other yeah. companies were doing this. And they, they were cutting yeah. the people at the bottom arbitrarily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. Just just like GE mm-hmm. did. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, no. I, I, I think the best thing is, is, is if they really want to know, just get hold of me, and I will, uh, I'll filter. Excellent. Well, thank you. So, let mm. me bring our interview to a close here. What I'm looking for are any parting words of wisdom or guidance that you might give to our audience, especially the people that are new to the field of performance improvement through through any means training or process re-engineering etc um yeah uh, they may be people that are young or middle-aged or older but what can you share with them um i think there's two things that that that, that they got to think about if it's just some thinking deming's diagram showed the you showed the uh the the customer, you know, and then and then the designed organization going to the suppliers behind, right? Now, if you get that diagram from Deming's book, it's a very useful thing to do is to say, what is the, the culture of my organization? Is it a downstream culture, which means they focus on marketing, selling, um, and uh, advertising, etc., etc., etc.? And the the customer comes first, or is it an upstream culture? And this is this is this is a not many people think about it, but it's really worth thinking about. So, for example, if you if you and we've been we've been brainwashed by Tom Peters and others about the importance of the customer. Yeah. Well, you go and try and talk marketing to Shell or Exxon, or they laugh at you because all the risk. All the energy goes into the upstream, the research, the development, getting it out the ground, getting it into the into the refineries. They don't give a damn. 
what happens to the customers? Customer care is not, they don't know what they say, they don't actually give a damn. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't, don't go in and investigate what's happening there because it doesn't exist. If you're going to extraction companies in particular, there's a different mentality, a different culture. They understand cost, they understand risk, and they understand, unfortunately, they tend to operate um, through coercion. You know, you, uh, if you, they're, they're all, you know, all companies in particular, and the mining companies, they will just go into a country and just forget about the locals and dive in, and they behave like that without realizing they do it to their own people. So that's, so is it, is it a, really um, a marketing company, a selling company? Um, if it is, then, then you need to say, well, okay, I'd like to understand um, how you define the demand and then how do you check that you are meeting that demand uh, and how do you continuously improve that? Th th those are the questions you ask. And I wouldn't ask the salespeople. I would go back and ask the people who are processing it one way or the other and say, how are things going with you? Do you get the information on time? Do you get the right information you need to make a decision? da di da di da di da And always work, I think, always talk to the people on the ground doing the work. I don't regard um, the sales and the marketing people in that category. You'd go to the people that are actually implementing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and and some of, and some of the best some of the best information I've ever received um, have been from people in reception and places like that. They know what's going on. They see it, um, and uh, and 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 just uh, just the last thing uh, in my book, the, in, the introductory part, the preface is is by a guy who who made his fortune selling doors on construction sites. You know when you want to make it secure, you have these huge doors. And he was he was going through an agent in, in Illinois, and I think there was two months. You had to get you order your door two months in advance when you're building, doing a project. And he just, being what he, being what he was, he thought, well, hang on, why two months? Well, surely there's guys who would like them earlier because sometimes you get a project which is, you know, the land becomes available and you want to get onto it. So he, he went through this systems thinking uh, and he looked at all the, and he pulled in his suppliers and said, okay, I think we can do this in less than a month. What do you think? And some of them said, I'm not interested. Others said, yeah, this is interesting. They worked it out on a basic computer program and he reckoned he could do it in three weeks. Mm -hmm. So he went to the agents and said, hey, I can do this in three weeks. And the agent said, no one's wanted it in three weeks. No one's come to us and said, we can do it in three weeks. He said, well, yeah, because you do it in two months. So he said, well, yeah. So he said, anyway, look, he said, if a guy comes in and he desperately needs it in three weeks, tell him to contact me. And would you believe within about a week that happened? Someone said, can you do it? He said, yes, I can. He didn't. It was about five days or six days late. So he sat down, pulled these people together, and the guy was still satisfied because it wasn't two months, mm -hmm. you see. And he said, um, "Where's the where's the where's the blockage? Where's the, you know where is the is the classic? There's a blockage here somewhere. Where is it?" And the receptionist said, "It's me. I'm the blockage because people phone up, and I can't tell them what the prices look like." What this, all I can say is you've got to go and talk to this department, that department. And she says, why didn't you give me the information? And he said, my God, of course. And so they gave her all the information that a client would, well, 80% that a client would need. And all, the phone call, half hour phone call happened. The client went away knowing what they had to do rather than five hours on the phone talk, talking to other people, disturbing them as well. And no one was happier than this receptionist of having a real job. Mm. So that kind of thing. So talk to the receptionist. <laughs> John, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate you spending the time with us and uh, let us capture your insights and wisdom. John Carlisle, thank you. Have a great day.
Thank you. Pleasure.